Thank you very much for that greeting. Good afternoon on a beautiful day in the state of Washington. It is a beautiful day, and it's been made more beautiful by our guest, Father uh, Andre Matlack, Poe Laureate, Arena Priest, and the Tacoma Refugee Choir. Thank you very much for enlightening us and inspiring us. We appreciate that. And a very warm welcome and congratulations to our 29 newly elected senators and representatives. I'm excited to be in service with you. And as Speaker Jenkins remarked yesterday, our government should be reflective and representative of the people we serve. And this year, we're welcoming the most diverse legislature in our state's history. And I want to give... If you allow me, I would like to express my deep appreciation for my family, particularly my grandchildren, who always inspire me to take the long view and particularly, of course, to Trudy Inslee, who's such a great partner. And I mean great. <laughs> Mr. President, Madam Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished justices of the court, members of the legislature, tribal leaders, state and local officials, and members of the consular corps, particularly the Ukrainian Honorary Council, Valery Holoborodko. We stand with Ukraine in the state of Washington. Washingtonians, after two years of delivering the state of the uh, state virtually, it really is great to be back together again. And I want to tell you, you all look great. You haven't aged a day in two years, so there's good news here. Look, I know we've got big challenges this session. As leaders, we will be called upon these next few months to act with decisiveness, with ambition, with audacity. And the good news is, is that here in Washington State, Ambition and audacity are both embedded in our state's DNA. And as I was giving thought about the challenges we face this session, I realized we aren't facing anything we aren't ready for. I was thinking about my comments today. Um, it was just something that we're ready to do. When you think about the things we've passed in the recent years that are now becoming real, and they need the, them to become real. People are eager to see bold and inclusive leadership and action. Think about this. Five years ago, we launched a transformation of our centuries-old behavioral health system. Today, that effort is resulting in dozens of new facilities opening throughout our state that offer more kinds of care in more places for more people. Two years ago, we funded a new type of rapid acquisition housing it's speeding up our ability to create supportive housing in a matter of weeks and months instead of years and decades. The climate policies we passed in recent sessions are now going into effect. And not only are these policies driving down polluting emissions, they are also creating thousands of clean energy jobs across our state. Two years ago, we passed a working families tax credit it starts next month. This credit will put as much as $1,200 into the hands of more than 400,000 Washington families. And the list goes on. Paid family leave, broadband access, career-connected learning, and the best financial program, financial aid program for our students in the nation. Here in our state, we invest in our people and we invest in our communities. It's a reason we have been rated the best state in America, the best economy in America, the second best for business, the third best state for workers. We can't be number one in everything. 
but we sure come close every year. And this is not an accident. It is because of the work we do in these chambers. And because of that work, and because of the work of millions of Washingtonians, I can proudly report to you this. The state of our state is strong. And I am happy. <laughs> if we continue building on the investments, and policies we've started, we can continue building a Washington where everyone is housed, where our schools are safe from gun violence and students receive the mental and educational support they need, where the existential crisis of climate change is met by unmatched innovation, where communities are welcoming and safe for all, where all people have a constitutional right to reproductive freedom, and where people struggling with mental health or substance use no longer fall unseen and unheard through the cracks. Building a Washington that fits this vision is entirely within our grasp this session. We can set the bar this high because we know we are able to achieve it. Let's take housing and homelessness as an example. We know states across the country are seeing an increase in homelessness, and Washington, unfortunately, is one of them. Why? Well, we know there are multiple reasons. Though some people face behavioral health challenges or chemical addiction issues, the fundamental underlying challenge is that we do not have enough housing in our state for our people. And it is a difficult irony of having such a strong economy. Well-paid workers flock here for jobs, forcing lower-paid workers to compete for housing. And when there's not enough housing for all, rents and prices sky skyrocket beyond what we can afford. And until we fix our housing crisis, thousands of people will remain homeless. Today, we're short 81,000 housing units and worsening by the thousands each year. Our population grew nearly 1 million people in the past decade, but housing stock only grew about 315,000 units. We're going to need another million units in the next 17 years. Again, until we fix our housing crisis, thousands of people will remain homeless. And we need a fix that provides a level of speed and scale beyond anything we've done in the past. Now, when it when it comes to building affordable housing, our housing trust fund has been our primary tool for decades. But unfortunately, we can only adjust that dial a little bit here and there. We have been adjusting it up every biennium since 2013, 30 to $50 million at a time. But it simply isn't enough. And if there was ever a time to go big, it's now. And I understand the frustration of those who wonder why this problem hasn't been solved yet, and I understand the allure of easy answers to homelessness. But we all know there are no easy answers. Simply moving a person experiencing homelessness from one street corner or city to another is not a real solution. Now, what is working are efforts such as the rapid acquisition program that we launched and you launched two years ago. That program is allowing us now to create thousands of new supportive housing units at a pace that has never been possible before. And this is a pace we have to sustain and accelerate at scale. Now, I've seen success of these programs in several housing projects that I visited, including a few months ago. Uh, I met a young man named John Tory Mackey. He was at a pallet shelter village in Vancouver called The Outpost. Tori told me that having a private space, all of his own, that was secure and access to services was the difference he needed to get effective treatment and get back on his feet. He told me it literally saved his life. I also met a, a woman named Millicent and her daughter McKenna last year. They lost their home right before COVID and couldn't find another place they could afford. But 
They found stability at the Willow Crossing in Seattle. I'd like you to meet Millicent and McKenna here. Thanks, Millicent McKenna. Where are you here? I'm looking for you there. Thanks for being here today. Now, their stories and stories like Tori's are not unlike most of the other 25,000 individuals experiencing homelessness in our state. When you're only one paycheck or one care, car repair away from a missed rent payment, it can feel impossible to find another option in a housing market like ours. So I will say it again, until we fix our housing crisis, thousands of people like these folks are gonna remain homeless. This is why I'm proposing a $4 billion referendum that will significantly speed up the construction of thousands of new units that will include shelters, supportive housing, and affordable housing. This will be combined with additional behavioral health support and substance use treatment and employment services and more. Why? Well, it's because we know that substance use treatment and mental health support can work when you combine it with secure, stable housing. So this is not a one-time effort to buy a one-time fix where the money just sort of disappears. This investment will turn into true assets. Once built, will provide a pipeline of affordable housing for tens of thousands of more people every year. And most importantly, a bonding referendum allows us to act now, not bit by bit, bit over the next 30 years. So this referendum will forward our ability to build importantly, and it offers it at the scale and the speed we need. Now, scale and speed are necessary for market rate development as well. We know that residential zoning restrictions block developers from building denser and more affordable options. And we simply have to finish the job we started last session to address middle housing and increase housing density within our communities. There is a way to do this that respects the unique character of our towns and cities, while also responding to the reality that, look, we are a growing, changing state. Again, until we fix our housing crisis, thousands of people will remain homeless. I believe the people of the state of Washington are with us on this. Let's go big. Let's get this done this session. Another issue confronting families and communities across Washington is behavioral health. And I've mentioned that we've launched an effort in 2018 to transform our behavioral health system. We had a century-old model of care that wasn't working. And since then, we've been building new community-based systems that help people get specific type of care they need closer to their homes and loved ones. And we've made thousands of new beds available to patients across Washington for care that ranges from crisis stabilization to substance use disorder. While we're still building, and my budgets contain funding to keep every part of our plan on track, including the new 350-bed forensic hospital at Western, we've got work to do. But much like our housing crisis, this is not enough, particularly when it comes to forensic services we are seeing an unprecedented increase in demand for competency evaluation and restoration services. A 60% increase in court orders just since 2018. 145% increase in inpatient referrals since 2013. This is not sustainable. This state has been and will continue doing its part to shore up capacity. And we have added hundreds of forensic beds since the True Blood trial in 2015. And we plan on, on adding hundreds more. But even with all these investments, this unprecedented growth in court orders and referral is not manageable or sustainable. Nor is our criminal justice system really an effective way to connect people to the treatment they really need to restore their lives. So we should be prioritizing diversion and community-based treatment options rather than using the criminal justice system as an avenue to mental health care, particularly because competency services only treat people to get well enough to be prosecuted. Now, this has been a frustrating, 
This has been a frustrating point of contention for families, lawyers, judges, patients, advocates, providers, and for me. We have to find a better way. Lawsuits and lawyers is not going to fix this problem. So I will be asking local leaders to join me in crafting a better plan, both for defendants' mental health and for public safety. Now, while we do these things, we're also continuing our efforts in education. And we know that meeting the social and emotional needs of our students is an extremely important effort. And I commend this legislature and you for making historic investments last year to increase funding for schools so that they can hire more nurses, counselors, psychologists, and social workers, which is always important, but particularly as we're coming through COVID. And my budget continues these additional investments. I'm also hopeful this year that we can increase funding for special education. I've proposed more than $120 million to better support school districts as they meet the needs of every student no matter how complex their needs. All told, my budget proposal increases K-12 through spending by $3 billion. We know the circumstances have been very difficult for students, educators, paraeducators, school bus drivers, and all the others who work in our schools. So I hope you can join me in a moment of recognition for these people who have been so instrumental in helping students navigate the challenges of COVID and beyond. Thank you to these educators. I'm appreciating the work. <laughs> on another positive note, one effort we have made tremendous progress on is climate. And when we see the tremendous damage that climate change is causing in our state, it's understandable to feel some despair at times. But I think we are also entitled to feel deep pride in what we have accomplished together. The tremendous pace of innovation, together with the policies we've adopted because of your leadership, ought to give us significant doses of hope when we need it. When I travel and meet with other government leaders from around the world, they know about the work we're doing in Washington. They know we're leading America on this noble effort. And we've passed several landmark policies that are transitioning us to clean transportation, to clean electricity, to clean buildings. Just last week, our clean fuel standard and our cap and invest programs went into effect. And we're doing this in a way that ensures overburdened communities will experience the economic and health benefits of this transition. Now, our focus shifts to implementation and investment. Now, when we do this, we need more capacity to permit clean energy projects in a timely manner. And we need to bolster our transmission infrastructure to reliably deliver clean energy throughout the state. We also need to expand our research and development capacity. And it was just fantastic to go over to Tri-Cities with Senators Wynn and Banky last month to talk about the potential for a new institute for Northwest Energy Futures at Washington State University. This institute will put the region to be a global leader and in the global forefront of clean tech innovation. Go Cougs! And I hope you can help on this. I am not above pandering to Sam Hunt, I will tell you that, I admit to that. Look, on the investment side, this is a really big deal too, obviously, now that this program is live. Our state's new Cap and Invest program will allow us this year to transform how we invest in transportation and our communities. Look, heat pumps for low-income families, charging stations across the state, hybrid electric ferries, free transit for youth, grants to clean up air pollution, the list goes on, again because of the work that you have done. 
The CCA will provide an estimated $1.7 billion that will be used for projects to drive down emissions, create jobs, and give people cleaner air and make communities healthier. This act is also helping us invest in the strongest suite of salmon recover action, recovery actions in the state's history. We know salmon are iconic to our state, to all Washingtonians, and certainly to the tribe's culture and way of life. This will also fund a new voluntary riparian grant program that offers landowners assistance to protect and recover these habitats statewide. Now here's a sad truth. Unfortunately, climate change will continue increasing temperatures of our waters and killing salmon for years to come, regardless of some of our best efforts. We need to minimize that, but we have to face this reality. So providing shade that helps cool rivers and streams is even more critical in the years to come. And I believe this, as legislators, when future generations look back at you and your efforts 40 to 50 years from now, I know they will be proud that you took action that gave their generation a chance. So let's do just that. Let's boldly continue our fight against climate change and salmon extinction this session. I know the list of things we intend to accomplish is long, but I've got a couple more things I'd like to touch on. The first is public safety. Now that phrase, Public safety evokes different meanings and ideas amongst people. And I think we need to escape the trap that public safety is about any one thing, mental health, or gun safety, or drug treatment, or law enforcement. The clear fact is we need them all. One thing we know is that gun violence is a significant driver of increased crime. This isn't a surprise considering that the gun lobby has worked for decades against common sense gun safety measures. Fortunately, in Washington State, voters and legislators have been willing to take on the gun lobby. We've enacted several measures to strengthen background checks and limit, put limits on the kinds of weaponry used in mass shootings. This year, we need to continue that work in three ways. First. One of the most meaningful measures and effective measures that we can take is requiring that people have safety training, basic safety training before they purchase a gun. Look, we expect that people have complete, we ought to expect that people have some basic training. We accept training in multiple parts of our lives. So we should expect that they will have basic training when they buy a gun. This has worked in other states and it's time to put this to work in Washington. Second, <laughs> second, we must increase accountability among manufacturers and dealers and give families and victims access to justice when those entities fail to do their dirt, uh, duty. And third, the time has come for the legislature to ban the sale of military-style assault weapons. These weapons... These weapons are designed for the sole purpose of destroying lives, the lives of school children, law enforcement officers, concert goers, nightclub patrons, and people gathered in houses of worship. We owe our children the assurance we're doing all we can to keep them safe. Let's pass all three bills and prove to them that the gun lobby doesn't make the rules in Washington State, we do.
Now, of course, gun safety laws are not the only thing we need. We want to help local law enforcement agencies to be able to hire and train more officers. They need more officers on our streets and in our neighborhoods. Last summer, Senator John Lovick and I were joined by dozens of chiefs and sheriffs to propose a new regional training centers. And these new facilities will allow us to train hundreds of more recruits and help law enforcement agencies recruit people from within their diverse communities. And also, sometimes the right response isn't necessarily by a law enforcement officer. So I applaud the incredible work underway to implement our new 988 system. Unlike most states, this legislature had the foresight to see this as much more than just a crisis hotline. We're using this opportunity to create a true behavioral health crisis response system. And your continued support puts us on a path to ensure people facing a mental health, substance use, or suicidal crisis can be connected to mobile responders or culturally competent behavioral health providers. Thank you for making this work possible. I appreciate your leadership. Let's keep it up. Now, there's one other very important priority we have to address, and that's the rights of Washingtonians seeking reproductive care. We know The Dobbs decision last year on a national level upended decades of precedent that assured people across the country had at least some measure of constitutional protection, constitutional protection for abortion care and contraception. That protection is gone for more than half the people in our nation. And the new Republican majority in Congress this weekend made further abortion restrictions one of their top priorities. So in Washington state, we are fighting to make sure that this right remains protected. We must protect patient data and privacy. We must protect access from the threat of healthcare consolidation and cost barriers. We must protect patients and providers from persecution by vigilantes and activist politicians in anti-choice states. And finally, and most importantly, we must pass a constitutional amendment that expressly establishes a fundamental right to reproductive freedom in the great state of Washington. Uh, before I close, I want to make a bit of a personal comment to you all. I want to express my personal thanks to you and to your families for your service this session. You have each left your hearth and home to come here to serve your constituents and further the progress and success of our state. And when you do so, I know you will all strive and toil to enact the policies you believe in. And yet, you may never know many of the actual people you've really helped due to your work. You may uh, never know the single mom you helped out of homelessness, but she'll be there. You may never know the teenager in a mental health crisis that you helped but they'll be there. You may never know the person who was not a victim of gun violence because of your actions, but they'll be there. They'll all be there by the hundreds and thousands, taken care of because of your efforts. And at the end of this session, I am confident you will feel the deep satisfaction of those who know that they have made a difference 
You know, we have emerged recently through two great threats, one to our personal health and our family's health, and one to our body politic. Because of the combination of scientific genius and sound decision-making in our state, we are no longer dominated by a virus. And because we stood up to those who dared to dismantle democracy, it is a joy to say with assurance and confidence that democracy is today intact in Washington State. So now, it is our blessed opportunity to fully exercise the power of democracy, not with half measures, empty gestures, or platitudes, but with the boldness and the ambition that is fitting to the unlimited capacity of the Evergreen State. We have a special state. We have a special moment. Let's realize both. Let's get to work. Thank you.